There is a million stories of people who got rich during the recession, people who got rich during difficult times. This is an opportunity to define ourselves. This is not a point of fear. <laughs> So obviously, hit show on TV, fixing bars and restaurants that are struggling. And right now, I feel like that is every bar and restaurant we know on the planet. Uh, this coronavirus has shut all of them down. It sent a lot of business owners into a tailspin and really, you know, looking into the future and thinking about how we come out of this, I'd love to hear your perspective on what we can do to support those who are so vital to our communities. And uh, especially Johnny and I being very familiar with the industry, having a lot yeah. of friends who own bars and restaurants as well. Uh, our heart goes out to them. We're just breaking right now thinking about it. It's an awful situation. You know, if we talk about today and then we talk about what happens when the pandemic ends, you know, there are two completely separate issues that we have to deal with in a separate way. And I was pleased to hear at least that the president is looking at a separate task force for the restarting of America uh, uh, than the task force that's focused on getting us through the pandemic. A couple of things to think about. You know, some people are doing pretty well with a delivery and curbside uh, uh, a delivery, but a curbside pickup. But, you know, this is a very different different time for restaurants and it's all about trust. Now, we don't go pick the food we want today. We pick the restaurant we trust right now. Yeah. And that's a big dynamic and change. For example, the other day I was on social media, guys, and there's a gentleman, a cook, a chef about 50 years old, standing in front of a stainless steel counter and he's laying a noodle down in his lasagna. And the post says, our famous lasagna is ready for curbside pickup at five o'clock. The guy's wearing gloves, but he's wearing street clothes. There's no mask on his face. There's no hat on his head. And he's sending all the wrong messages that we haven't changed as an industry. I really think that I created Tapper's Tavern, which opens in July, and it's the kitchen of the future. It's all robotic. And the premise of Taffer's Tavern is that it looks more like an operating room than it does a kitchen. The kitchen of the future, guys, has people not wearing street clothes in it. They're wearing a hat, but not from home like a surgeon would wear, a hat over their head that, has, that comes out of a uniform bin, not street clothes. They're wearing a mask over their face, so they're not breathing on food. And they're wearing gloves. I mean, we as an industry have to change right now. So when I think of that guy with that picture making that lasagna, he's sending all the wrong messages to people. Now, there are other drive throughs I won't mention brand names, guys, but there's a drive through that you drive through, and there's a big window when you get to the drive through window and there's white tiles in the kitchen and they're in white suits and they're in white hats and it's been this way all along. You go to that place because it's so clean. And I ask you a question. If you close your eyes and thought, what restaurant brand is famous for being clean? There isn't one. They're famous for ribs or famous for chicken or famous for this. Nobody's famous for clean. But yet that's the image we have to project today. So messaging has to change. Visuals have to change. Procedures have to change. You know, in our Taffer's Tavern model, they come in in street clothes. They put on a suit that we provide. They put on their gloves and their hat. They take their temperature, which is logged in a computer system. It's taken every two hours. We're monitoring hand washing. So it's a different style of operating. We have to operate different. We have to communicate very differently. And we have to motivate differently. So... Those that are doing that are winning. You know, Tiffany Derry in Dallas, Texas, who you've seen on my show, she sold well over 200 lunches by delivery and curbside yesterday because she's sending the right messages. Think about that. In her little restaurant, she would do 200 covers in a normal lunch. She's duplicated her business with to go because her messaging is right. She's created trustworthiness about procedures and process and delivery. That's what's going to get us out of this is one simple word, trust. And we will go to the businesses we trust. There's another element about capacity, but you know, what do you guys, you guys agree with what I'm saying? Isn't that where we're going as, as an industry? Well, 100%. And, and certainly, I, I know for myself and what I've been seeing from my friends, so I live in, uh, AJ and I both are in Hollywood. <clears throat> there had certainly been a lot of apprehension for a lot of people ordering at restaurants for that fact, because 
there's been a lot of questions in the air about how this spreads and there's still a lot of questions that haven't been answered that makes people very cautious. Um, I, know, I, I also spent 12 years in North Carolina and it was funny, I had just saw a friend who, who posted that their local barbecue place is doing better now than they ever have. Be first of all, it was local, there was that trust build up and just the way that they've been handling their curbside service has kept that trust and even brought more for, for the service they're, they were doing. And messages, and AJ and I know just even in our own business, that message has to change with how people's temperaments are in order to reach them. Our temperaments are going to be fueled by our emotions. And if you're unable to tap into those emotions, that, that message is going to go right over your head. I completely agree. And then, you know, when we take a look at, let's assume we build trust and let's assume that you feel this is a safe environment and that you trust the food service guys and, you know, you trust that the kitchen is clean. I'd be putting internet cameras in my kitchen today. I'd want you to see that. I'd want you to be able to go online and see my sanitation. I want to send that message. I want you to know it. I want it to be transparent and I want you to trust me. But, you know, after the pandemic ends, we're not going to pack into bars and restaurants so quickly. We're certainly not going to pack into football stadiums and stuff so quickly. You know, we're not going to sit shoulder to shoulder with people. So think about every restaurant and bar in America or every movie theater, every Broadway show. You know, anything that I call an LBE. An LBE is location-based entertainment. Whether it's a bowling center, a movie theater, a bar, a restaurant, these are location-based entertainment facilities. You're not going to sit shoulder to shoulder with a stranger next month or next week or two months or probably three or four months from now. So every restaurant and every bar, every movie theater, every, every business that is in that type of an LBE format going forward loses capacity when we come out of this. Yeah. A restaurant has to spread tables. A bar has to spread bar seats. A movie theater has to spread seating. So let's say that based upon different floor plans and different physical configurations, we lose 30% of our seating capacity, 40%. In some situations, it's 50, 60% of capacity is lost. Wow, geez. What about a restaurant that does 100 covers during an hour during lunch? That now is reduced to 70 covers or 60 covers. So 30% of revenue potential is gone. That's horrifying if we think about it, but wait a minute. There's business models we can create around this. And I want to tw twist this for a second. What if I told you that the end of this pandemic might be the greatest marketing opportunities of all time? What if I told you the end of this pandemic is the opportunity for people who are geniuses in communications to go to work? People who are geniuses in process and procedures and building trust, brands with integrity. When I think about the end of this pandemic, somebody's going to win, right? Somebody's going to step out of the crowd. Somebody's going to take this market share. Why not you? Why not me? Why am I I'm not Joe's Bar in Albuquerque, New Mexico? So I'd like people to think about, sure, the misery we're going through, the clock that's ticking. But when this is over, it becomes a marketing opportunity unlike we've never seen before. Yep, we're going to lose a bunch of our uh, independent businesses. I get that, guys. 20, 30% of restaurants might never open. And I'd like to talk about stimulus in that for a moment or two. But clearly, we're going to lose restaurants. Clearly, we're going to lose capacity in a marketplace. And we're going to lose capacity within these businesses. But guys, I, in a way, can't wait to start that marketing, that messaging. So there is, I don't want to call it a silver lining, but there's an opportunity for the great marketers of the world, the great companies of the world, the great operator of the world to really seize this, step up, build consumer trust, and define where we're going as an industry, as a nation, and as small businesses. That's the part that excites me, guys. That's what keeps me going during this, is looking forward to that. John, I love your growth mindset. I, I know for AJ and myself, when we were coming into this place and shelter, we were trying to figure out what things can we work on in the company that this gives us this opportunity that we hadn't had with everything else that we were doing. So it brought some focus in. One of my big concerns, and I don't know if you're familiar with the book by Ray Oldenburg, The Great Good Place, which is about the, the corner bar or the cafe. And, and, and every 
in, in civilization in every neighborhood that allowed folks to get together and hash out ideas and build society to where it is today. I, you know, coming out of this, there is certainly going to be a play to, to get people back to being comfortable to starting those social interactions with the table next to them. Now that's certainly going to take some time. And I think envisioning what these places in the future are going to look like, certainly that's got to come into play of how that's going to work out as well. You know, it's interesting. There was a philosopher in England in the 1700s. I've quoted him on Bar Rescue full times. Forgive me, his name escapes me. He used to call it the coveted third place. Yes. Yes. Right? That you have your home as place one, you have your work as place two, and a great bar is that coveted third place because it's part of your life. You know, it's part of your routine, your habits. You know, the second public building built in America was a bar, guys. The first was a church. In those bars, they had these little compartments or areas they used to call snugs, little half walls between every table. That's so the priest or the governor or whoever could sit next to the bum and there'd be a little table between them. And everybody would go to these public houses then they were called because they were public houses. And that's mm -hmm. where business deals were done and marriages were made and, and borders were created and bill of rights and constitutions were discussed. There were no city halls. There were no corporate me uh, meeting rooms. There were no hotel uh, convention centers to go to. So we were the center of the community. And I'm with you, Johnny. You know, when you think that that is lost going forward to some degree, you know, that's a sociological impact that's really, really powerful. And losing things like that is meaningful. If I can, there's a movie that's one of my favorite movies called The Ghosts of Flatbush. And it's a documentary film about when the Brooklyn Dodgers left Brooklyn and the sociological impact upon that city. Sure. You know, Major League Baseball is talking about playing the season in Arizona. Great, we get to watch baseball on TV. But what happens to the Bronx in New York? What happens to downtown St. Louis when Bush Stadium doesn't open again? You know, what happens to downtown San Francisco when the ballpark doesn't? So there is a sociological impact to this. And I think, guys, we, people like us in the media, can't let that happen. We have to figure out how to still keep everybody communicating and group think it's not an enemy sometimes, it's a friend. And we have to get together and, and, and still exchange. I'm with you, Johnny. That's one of the scariest things of me, not only is loss of business, but impact upon our society. And it could be significant. Yeah, that isolation and anxiety leads to so many mental health issues and we're already just starting to feel it. And to exactly that point, this is going to end and there is going to be a new normal. And if we're not thinking about what that new normal is, if we're thinking that we're just going to revert back to the old, the restaurants are going to reopen, the bars are going to be packed again, we've lost sight of where we are in this situation. And one of the things that jumps out at me about Bar Rescue especially is operationally, how many of these business owners are struggling. And now you're seeing operations being challenged because they can't move and evolve quickly enough. Some are doing curbside well. A lot of them are failing. Some are just giving up. What is your message to those business owners, because it's not just restaurants, who are feeling this challenge and who know that operationally they haven't been strong? How can we muster through this? Well, you know, one of the things that concerns me is, is the current relief package. You know, in essence, gives you the payroll for eight weeks for your employees. And if you do the paperwork, and it's not easy, guys, we submitted ours last night at around midnight. It's eight pages of documents. You know, you have to access everything from corporate resolutions to payroll records for the past year. There's a lot of mathematical calculations and stuff you need to do. I'm lucky. I have an accountant who will help me do those things. For Joe Blow in Dubuque, Iowa, wherever the heck he is, this is not such an easy process to complete these documents, get all this information. And then if there's one mistake in the form, they kick it back to you. You sort of go back to the end of the line again. So there's no room for error in filing these things. The wonderful news is most of the banks, the local banks are helping everybody get through this. They're reviewing the applications in advance, so they're trying to help. Here's what worries me. We're spending all of our resources now on these next eight weeks to keep all the employees working when we have no restaurants open. So we're paying all this money with zero productivity attached to it. What worries me is eight, 10, 12 weeks when we reopen, guys, and we will, you know, whether it's six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, dare I say 12 weeks, but we will. Every restaurant in America is gonna to have to buy new inventory. 
Every walk-in is empty. All the food has been thrown out, spoiled, uh, uh, given away, etc. Starting a restaurant with a complete new inventory is not an inexpensive thing to do. So there's no provisions right now in any of the relief packages to say, okay, I'm opening John's restaurant. My opening inventory is going to cost me $7,000. Where do I get that $7,000 to fill my walk-in so that I can open? We're not dealing with that as a government yet, and we must. Also, think about this, guys. If I don't fill that walk-in, the manufacturer doesn't get the order. The distributor doesn't get the order. The farmer doesn't get the order. This goes right down the chain and impacts everyone. So I think it's critical as the government look at opening stimulus package, not sustaining stimulus package during the pandemic. The opening stimulus package must provide inventory credits so that bars can, and restaurants can get the dollars now because some of these inventories are CODs. Some of them have to be paid within two weeks or 30 days based upon credit terms. So some of us don't have the money to lay out for the inventory to get a check from the government six weeks later. So we have to deal with this inventory issue. We're dealing with payroll, we're dealing with rent, we're dealing with some utilities. The next big hit is giving all of these restaurants the resources to buy their inventories, fill their walk-ins. The next thing is if I can go on for another minute or two, guys, Please. is menus have to change. You know, the yeah. days of 20 page menus can't be the same because I can't waste food anymore. So I have to put the eight or 10 menu items that I know I'm gonna sell that move through. That'll reduce what I buy in inventory, reduce what I'm carrying in inventory. That'll help my numbers a little bit. If my revenues go down 30, 40% just capacity, I wanna contract my inventory a little bit and my labor a little bit as well. So if we get these inventory credits, we work on making menus smaller, more condensed. We work on seating capacity. I believe guys, a few months later, I can drop in one more table. A couple months later, maybe one or two more tables. We can start to move the stools together as antibody programs come into play or vaccine programs come into play. So, you know, there is not a yes and a no. I think we ease out of this sort of a table at a time, if you will. And then at some point, I'm not sure we ever get back to the normal of packing people in again. But, you know, I think that we will get back to 80% of normal, keeping more manageable distances between us. What I fear is the nightclubs. I don't see a packed dance floor or a stand-up nightclub coming back for a long, long time. I think local bars, restaurants uh, will. I think fine dining will be impacted less than casual dining because the seating tends to be more spread in the first place. Yeah right? So their capacity, when you look at casual dining, seats are packed much tighter together. So it's going to create a greater impact upon their capacity. But these are the kind of things we're going to have to deal with, guys, from the kitchen uniforms and the procedures to, you know, the way we serve food. You know, does a server run food to the, kit, to the table now? Well, if they're touching money, they certainly can't go anywhere anymore. So I don't think servers touch food anymore. I think only food runners run food. And I think those food runners don't touch money, don't touch customers. All they do is touch food. They're in white chef coats, so they're attired in a way that you know they're clean. They're wearing gloves. I mean, these are the kind of things we need to do procedurally to, you know, to really build that trust and get to the point that we can add a table here and a table there. Well, I think for, the, for these societies, for these towns, even in Hollywood here, I, getting the economy started and getting these restaurants and getting these people working together is, is much more important than making sure that traffic can flow properly. So by closing down some of these streets and putting some tables outside, we can get, we can get some space. We can get iPads on each of the tables so you can order your food into the back and we can get the food runners and then you can pay at the register uh, slowly. We can at least get some of that moving. Hollywood Boulevard doesn't need traffic. In fact, I'd love to see it just shut down and restaurants and tables outside and people be getting to fill the streets again here in the uh, beginning of summer. You know, I think that's an amazing thought, John, and I'm with you 100%. We were talking about that with regard to Times Square in New York yes. and some of the outsiding areas that they've mm -hmm. done in Manhattan. But, you know, you're exactly right. Look at, you know, guys, I'm an old Hollywood boy. I lived there for many years. I ran Barney's Beanery. I oh, ran the Troubadour. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so when in, in the early 80s, I was in a band called the West Hollywood Rude Boys. <laughs> playing right. So, So, I mean, look at Santa Monica Boulevard. 
Look at yeah. the areas of Santa Monica Boulevard yeah. by San Vicente there. I mean, that could completely be closed off. All cafes, all restaurants. There's a block or two of Sunset that could be closed off. Hollywood Boulevard is a natural, obviously, to create a pedestrian mall around that, which could drive tourism back again also. And the wonderful thing is today's POS systems have remote tablets. So I don't have to run back and forth to order. My server can stay outside taking care of tables. Food runners run the food back and forth. This can be done really smart. But I think those are the moves, guys. I think that's the way that this has to go, is if we can add 30% capacity on the street to make up for the, what we lost inside, Johnny, that's a home run. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we're attending a beautiful time of year in Hollywood, for example. Sitting yeah. outside is wonderful now. So, yeah. you know, I hope that the city gets on board with programs like that. I think it'll make a big difference. And everybody will drive up and down Franklin then, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's the plan. Well, interesting well, to go along with that. They just released the plan a few months ago about how they wanted to reduce the traffic on Hollywood and bring all these tables out and make it more pedestrian friendly. So, I mean, if this just nudges that whole idea along a little, a little faster. I think it does. You know, my worry is what happens to the restaurants that are not on those streets then. Obviously, right. it's going to slant that way so the other guys get hurt. There's no scenario that helps everyone, guys. But I think that's a great scenario to protect at least areas that have dense concentration of restaurants and bars. We could isolate those areas in these key cities, create these two-block malls, if you will, without dining. And if they look at clusters and grant that to clusters around the city, uh, I think a program like that makes a lot of sense. I think for a lot of us who aren't restaurant or bar owners, we have friends, family suffering because of this loss of jobs. And, you know, for me personally, I've been actually picking up my groceries from restaurants because they still have supply chain. There's not massive lines like we're seeing at all these grocery stores. And a lot of times the ingredients that restaurants are getting are higher quality than I could even get if I were to go to Trader Joe's. What are some other things that we could do to support this vibrant community of people who are struggling for those of us who aren't bar or restaurant owners ourselves? I think that's a great idea. I think that deconstructed meals provided by chefs locally are a great opportunity. Tiffany Deary is doing that down in Dallas very, very successfully. So, so, you know, they're dissecting the meal in cities where you can sell cocktails now. I mean, we've put together cocktail programs with a small little decanter. It's a drink and a half with a snap plastic top and you get two glasses of ice. So when you get the decanter, you shake it <laughs> and you pour it into your glass with ice and the cocktail still has integrity. It's not watered down and everything. So we got to think about packaging. We got to think about deconstructed meals. We got to think about a burger and a beer package. You know, we want to create as much selling as we can. Look guys, there's only three things in a restaurant business. There's new customer programs, there's frequency programs and there's spend programs. That's all we got. So whether I'm doing curbside delivery, whether I'm doing delivery, I got to get new customers interested in what I'm doing. I've got to get my existing and frequent customers participating with me more often, whether it's deconstructed meals, cook at home meals, fully prepared meals, free desserts with meals, free beverages with meals. I've got to keep them frequently engaged with me or my brand's going to disappear from their mindset and then I'm screwed. And then the last element is I got to build spend. So if you call me and if I'm getting an order, what can I add to that order? Boy, cheesecake's only $2. It's normally four ninety five. dollars Great. By the way, for the pandemic, we're running an extra king size uh, shrimp cocktail, two extra pieces, only $3 more, your best value. We got to work at building that sale. We got to work at creating frequency. Every delivery that goes out, and they're not doing this, should have a coupon for the next delivery staple to the bag. Every single one, but we're not doing that. So this sale needs to drive the next sale. That sale needs to increase our spend. We're not doing those things. The I've ordered restaurant delivery, not one has come with a coupon for the next deal. Free dessert next time, free this. So we gotta work this better as an industry. Right now we're fighting on how to delivery. How Let's work on merchandising through our deliveries and marketing. That's the next step, guys. And nobody's doing that. I haven't seen that from any one of you. I've seen the – so with the local restaurant that I've been ordering from, they've been giving me discounts on future orders right Smart. out of the gate. 
they've been sending me messages now because I had to place it over email saying, hey, these are the new ingredients we have. We have fresh Branzino. We didn't have that last week. We have red snapper. We didn't have that last week. And they've been letting me know as the stock is limited and it's dwindling. So I have an urgency now to go back to the restaurant to get my groceries more frequently. You know, I was trying to avoid the grocery store. I typically, before the pandemic, would go once a week. But I've gone back to this restaurant multiple times to get smaller orders because they're telling me, hey, this is fresh from the farmer. This is ready to go. I've seen produce boxes from some other restaurants here in LA that have been snapped up, limited edition, straight from their farmers. And I have seen an uptick in merchandise. So hats and shirts that I never saw at these restaurants, touting the logo, talking a little bit about how much the restaurant means to you, right? We all have, as we were saying, that third place that's now disappeared. And the other thing that I haven't seen that I, I think would be pretty fascinating is we're all sitting at home. We miss that bar environment. Why do bars not set up Zooms where there's a camera in the bar? You see the bar. Maybe the owner's only there drinking with you, but all the regulars can get in and we can still have a conversation like we're having here. You know, we tried to do this in studio in L.A. This is what we have right now. And I feel like thinking outside of the box and looking for opportunities to engage your customers, right? All those people with POSs who are collecting email addresses and phone numbers, now is the time to talk to those customers who are so meaningful for you before the pandemic and let them know, hey, there's still an opportunity to support us. I completely agree. And that's sort of that social media strategy. And, and when I was talking about operate, communicate, motivate. Those are the three things that we need to focus on doing differently now. You know, I applaud that restaurant by telling you about the fresh Benzini, they're driving frequency, right? Benzini might be more expensive than one of the other menu items. So they're also driving you to buy a more expensive menu item at the same time. Hopefully they bought it at the right price. So it's a high profit item for them. You know, the greatest restaurants of all steer you to order what they want you to order. They don't let you order what you want, <laughs> right? Because yeah. they steer you, they box it, they shadow it, but they steer you to buy what they're really good at and what's really profitable for them. So I applaud that restaurant and those are all the things that they should be doing. We have fresh this, we have fresh that. Give me a reason to call you today and I will. So, you know, that's what more people need to be doing. Unfortunately, AJ, I think that's, that's the rarity not the commonality today. And I applaud that restaurant. They're doing a great job. Many are not. Many are just saying our, our limited menu is available online and they're not focused on the next purchase or what's fresh or, you know, steering you to buy something that would excite you today. Well, you know, one of the reasons that I love the show so much is because you see the change. You see the owners change. You see management change. You see the employees take on these new roles and new positions and really thrive. And I think that's really the power of the show. And you know, now entering the seventh season, and you are a change maker. And right now is that time for change. And a lot of us, in uncertainty, we're shutting down. We're letting fear get the best of us. Yeah. And you know, going through your book and looking at all of these excuses, you know, these are even more relevant now than ever before. And the two that really jump out at me are the fear of failure. So for a lot of business owners right now, they're, they're frozen and they're unwilling to even try some of these things because, oh, well, what if no one answers my call? What if no one orders the Branzino? Then I'm stuck. And then the other one is scarcity. And right now we're all feeling that scarcity because everyone's spending has declined. Everyone is feeling there's a lack of opportunity. So Let's unpack both of those because I think those are so relevant. The first is that fear of failure. What can we say to those of us who are restaurant and bar owners or, or even sitting here saying, you know what, I have more time than ever, but I, I need to do something. You know, a failure in the book is the number one excuse that I dealt with. And you're talking about don't BS yourself, uh, uh, cut the excuses that are holding you back. Uh, uh, but, you know, most of the time we're scared about something that millions of people have already done, AJ. You know, other, other than standing on the edge of a cliff, of course, you should be scared of that. But, but, you know, look at the recession that we went through, right? Look at World War II that we went through. Look at history. My great grandparents got rich during the depression. Everybody else was going broke. They got rich during the depression. When it ended, they were millionaires. There is a million stories of people who got rich during the recession, people who got rich during difficult times. This is an opportunity to define ourselves. This is not a point of fear. This is a point of believing in yourself and stepping out of it. Somebody 
is going to get rich through this. Some restaurants are going to survive. Some restaurants are going to grow. Some restaurants are going to build a level of trust in a community that's going to take them to three, four, five, ten units in three years. Why not you? So, you know, I think that that comment of relativity and understanding, there is somebody in your town who's going to be hugely successful at this. If they can be, then you claiming fear is your reason not to be is BS. It's just not true. You know, the other one is scarcity, as you said, AJ, which is obviously another big one. But there's a third one, which is really prevalent right now, which is circumstance. And circumstance is saying, boy, you know, there's no economy now. I can't do anything. You know, there's nobody going out. I can't do anything. The circumstances are so bad, I can't succeed. Well, again, I'm going to refer to moments in history and when people got incredibly well. You know, scarcity didn't affect Stephen Jobs circumstance when he was going up against IBM didn't stop Stephen Jobs. So he didn't let the circumstance of the marketplace stop him. He didn't let the scarcity of money stop him. Neither did Henry Ford. Neither did Thomas Edison. And I'm picking names that we all know, of course. But, you know, neither did Joe Blow, who owns the drugstore in the corner, who's been in business for 75 years and made it through World War II, made it through the recession, made it through this. So, guys, there's stories of success in circumstance, scarcity, and fear all around us, find them and use them as your sp- source of motivation and inspiration. Don't talk to the guy who's frozen, is scared, is not going anywhere. Look at the people who are moving forward. Those are the ones we need to attach ourselves with. Those are the ones we need to emulate. That's the energy we need to surround ourselves with right now. Don't you guys agree? Absolutely. 100%. And- Right now, I I think that failure, it's all around us. We should not be afraid of it. Everywhere you look, there is failure. So there's no spotlight on your failure versus the government's (laughs) failure, the restaurant's failure, the drugstore's failure. Everyone is failing right now. The only ones who are failing more are the ones who aren't even trying in the first place, that are just sitting on their laurels and throwing their hands up and saying, I can't do it, I can't try. You know, I, I sometimes think of the baseball player in the World Series who's, this is his fourth at bat in this game, and he struck out three times. And it's a tie game, and at the end of this pitch, either he's going to be a bum or he's going to be a hero. And right now, that's the moment we are at. We're either going to be bums and embrace all these excuses and blame the world for our failure and blame everybody else for our situation, or we're going to swing and hit that freaking ball and this is our defining moment. And the fact that we struck out three times shouldn't stop us from swinging on that fourth pitch just as much. So I hate to use silly analogies like that, but it's a solid analogy. And we should remember that the greatest baseball players of all time stroke, struck out thousands of times. <laughs> Every one of them struck out thousands of times, but it never stopped them from believing that they're going to hit it next time. And that's where we have to think right now. We can make this. We need to support each other a little more. I think our communities need to step up to to support small business. But the communities are ready to step up to to support small business. We need to give them the reason. So again, guys, I'm back to what I said earlier, in essence. This is an opportunity for those that seize it. It's a defining moment. What do I want my kids to think of me five years from now? What do I want my wife to think of me five years from now? What do I want, you know, my career to be five years from now? If we think about those things, there's no choice. Let's go to work and let's win. Let's figure out how we make this right. Let's find that secret sauce together to figure this out. Those that seek will find. I think something else to to keep in mind, and, and I know for myself, part of my personality, and you were mentioning about the Troubadour and Barney's Meanery, for me, it's the same thing. I love going to see shows, going to the Viper Room, going to the Whiskey. Uh, if I'm not there to see some friends play, I'm the one who people are going to see perform. And I miss those nights more than anything in this last month. And I know the minute that I have those opportunities again, I'm certainly going to revel in them because I've, I've missed them so much and everyone's going to be yearning for those moments. So figuring out ways to quench people's uh, thirst for that now through social media, but being ready to give people that, that, uh, that entertainment when the, the opportunity comes in a way that allows people to feel safe, they're going to flock to that. I completely agree because we miss it. 
And, you know, if we think about, look, it's hard for me, guys. I'm sure the weekends are the hardest for me because at least during the week I get to talk to guys like you and I get to work in a little bit. But Saturday and Sunday are freaking brutal, right? Sitting here alone and trying to keep myself busy. And, and I'm sure you guys are going through the same thing. I can't wait to be in a room with people again. Yeah. I can't wait to go back to work again. Sure, I'm going to stand a few feet away from you, Johnny, <laughs> but I still can't wait to look in your eyes, buddy. And, and you know, that's the reality of it. And in the end of the day, I think that human instinct, that human desire for socialization is what's going to pull this economy back together again, because we want to be together again. And the places where we're most together are businesses. There was a tweet that my buddy put out that I just thought hit so hard, which was, he's like, I miss the people at the gym every morning that I don't, don't even talk to. And sure. it's because of that familiarity of knowing that when they're there, you know that everything's okay. It's a normal right. day. When they're not there, that's when you, it triggers something like is something going on. Where is that person? And for anyone who has their, their routines and their days set, we all miss the little things that allowed us to know that, that we were safe, that it was an average day. It is those small things that kept us together, that kept us smiling. Yeah, and you know, when I think about the bar business, guys, people have always said, that I've been in bar business now, shoot, almost 40 years. And I always say to people, you know, I'm in this business because I'm in the business of making people smile. That's what I do for a living. If I do my job right, people's feet tap, their head moves, you know, they smile, they talk, they interact with people. I'm in the business of making people happy. And I think that as a restaurant and bar industry, as the hospitality industry, we need to embrace what our social responsibility is to our country and our communities. And it is to, pro to provide that third place, guys, <laughs> back full circle. We have a responsibility as bar operators, restaurants, and meeting places to get us all back together again in a responsible way. But it is up to the bars, restaurants, and those businesses that are LBZEs, location-based entertainment, to put together the programs to pull us back together again. Because, Johnny, I want to see you over a beer, buddy. You know, yeah. I want you sitting across the table from me. And that's what I want, AJ, and so do you. So I think our industry has a responsibility, not just a business motive, to get us back together again in a safe way. And I, I think we're all ready for that moment. You know, Boy, we just we. want to do our part to get there. And, you know, as we're in this situation right now and we're now looking to technology to communicate more, we're really feeling that that hole in our lives. Whereas before, exactly that, we would look forward to the weekend because we could get out there and socialize. We could get out there to that third place, to that place of familiarity. And that's all gone right now. Everything is on pause. Yeah. Well, maybe we should do a happy hour together online, guys. I'm in. Let's pull our friends' resources together. Maybe we should do something like that online. And let's pull a few hundred right. people together and have some fun. I'm game. You guys are great. I'd love to do it with you. But if that's something you guys want to do, let's work yeah. on it together. Let's do it. Yeah. I would love that. I know that all of our fans listening, they, they are right there with us and missing it as well. I mean, we've had to shut down our social skills training in person and, and we frequent bars and restaurants. Why? Because they're social places for us to work on these skills and we're all missing that opportunity. And I think for many of us, you know, we've stayed in touch with our friends, but even those strangers sitting next to us at the bar, right? It, it has that common community feeling that's just lacking in all of our lives right now. I think that's the key word, community, sense of community. Unfortunately, sense of the community today are more online based, but we can still get that sense of community when we're together in groups like that. And I think that we all have to work on that. I'm working on a happy hour with my wife that we're going to do in, in, in about a week or so. We're planning it out. And, you know, we're trying to do what we can from this end. And, and uh, you know, we need to be social. So let's be digitally social for a while. And then we'll be physically social as soon as we can. Yeah, we Better than nothing. Yeah. We Absolutely. Certainly, we've certainly been telling our listeners that this is the time where you're able to get access to a lot of people that in the, and been before that you might not been able to. Everyone wants to connect. Everyone has extra time. And with that just takes you to be able to reach out. And it's no different than chatting up the person next to you sitting on that bar stool. I've been causing myself to call five friends a day. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to make myself call five different friends every day. So I'm going back to high school years and I'm going back and I'm, <laughs> I spoke to a friend who I grew, I've known since I'm six years old, we grew up together. 
and there was a hole in each other's bushes when we were kids to run through. So, so it's a wonderful opportunity. You're right, Johnny, to reconnect with friends and people. So in a way, this reconnection that we're doing, you know, through phone and, and video conference with old friends who maybe we haven't talked with so much in the past, you know, there's a, a heartwarming element to that also. I've had some wonderful conversations with great friends that maybe I wouldn't have had if we weren't in this situation. So maybe that's a little bit of the silver lining, Johnny, is we're getting to talk to people we don't get to speak to often, and maybe we haven't spoken to in a long time. And I think we're being more vulnerable than ever. Right. I think it, before this, uh, speaking about our fears or our uncertainty, you know, we probably would dodge with some of the people that we're not as close with. And I feel like now everyone is opening up and sharing. And I think a lot of us are in this situation, working from home, struggling with motivation. And, you know, I've seen you break down operations in the bar, but I've also seen you motivate these staff members who other managers who the owner couldn't motivate, couldn't unlock that. What is your advice for those of us who are just feeling unmotivated right now? Well, you know, in Bar Rescue, very often I go back to personal accountability. And you'll hear me say to that crazy employee, is this the person you want to be? You know, is this what your mother raised? I mean, I want to, I got to change what people do. And if I tell them, don't do this, do that, don't do that, do these, they go back to what they used to do. So the only way I can change what they do is by changing what they think. That's why Bar Rescue gets so heavy, guys, because I'm challenging not what you do. I'm challenging the way you freaking think. And I'm telling you, and I'm not saying it in these words, but in essence, I'm telling you the way you think is really screwed up, man. <laughs> and when I challenge them, whether I appeal to their pride, show them a picture of their children, appeal to their fear, what's going to happen when you lose your house, what's going to happen when you lose your car, what's going to happen when your wife leads you, whether I appeal to their financial stresses, I have to somehow cause them in a second to say, uh-oh, maybe he's right. And in that moment, their brain opens up and I can walk in. That's why it's so intense. That's why I look them in the face and say, why are you failing? Why, if they don't say I'm failing because of me, I go crazy. And I'll tell you a funny story of how uh, Don't BS Yourself started. I was at about 120th episode of Bar Rescue and I was in Detroit, Michigan. Doing That's a where I'm from. Michigan. And, and I was doing a bar that was near the Ford uh, uh, Proving Grounds. Yeah. And the owner of that bar, I looked at her and I said, why are you failing? And she said to me, AJ will love this. She said to me, John, I'm failing because of the Euro in Greece. <laughs> this is a bar in Detroit, Michigan. Yeah. She had a few Greek customers. So I looked at it. And when she said that to me, at that moment, I realized, guys, in 120 bar rescues, Anytime I've ever asked anybody, why are you failing? Not once did somebody say, John, I'm failing because of me. Not one freaking time. Every time it's the market, it's the community, it's construction on the street, it's the governor, it's Congress, it's the Euro in Greece. I mean, every <laughs> excuse in the world. And one day I realized, guys, that the common denominator of failure is an excuse. And think about what an excuse is. An excuse is a reconciliation of a screw up within your own mind. Either I did something I shouldn't have, didn't do something I should have, or screwed up. So now I come up with an excuse. Oh, it's because of this. Now I can live with myself. But it's complete deflection in its rawest sense. And we BS ourselves all the time by accepting these excuses. You know, oh, I can't do this. I'm not going to, I'm not in a delivery business. I can't, I don't know how to deliver food. I, I'm, who else is that's doing it? So we come up with these excuses. So I realized if an excuse is in essence, the reconciliation of a mistake, then we got to stop the excuses because excuses paralyze us. You know, AJ, because of the, the scarcity you were talking about before, I freeze or fear, I freeze. And now we're paralyzed. So excuses in my mind are the common denominator of failure. And if I can get you to not give an excuse, AJ, then tomorrow morning when you look in the mirror, you say, I'm not failing because of the euro in Greece. You look in the mirror and you say, I'm failing because of me. And you won't like it. <laughs> when you yeah. hold yourself accountable, you don't freaking like it. And then I can cause you to change. That's bar rescue in a nutshell, guys, is forcing that individual accountability upon them, making themselves understand that either they're a jerk, they're an ass in the way they acted, you know, or they're irresponsible to their families or they're letting themselves down, they're ruining their family legacy. I mean, this moment of realization of them saying, uh-oh, maybe I'm wrong, 
is when I walk in, beat the hell out of them, guys, knock them down, and then start to rebuild them in a way that they buy into. And that's my process in a nutshell. And it all came down to that woman saying the Euro in Greece changed everything for me, realizing that anytime somebody wakes up in the morning and blames their failure on somebody else, they have no reason to change. You know, it's, it's interesting. Certainly, it, for us, and doing the work that we do, it's observationally, we see it that the, the more intelligent the person is, the more complex the, the Excuse. set of excuses go. <laughs> and it, it takes a little bit of time to untangle them. But one of the things that I noticed that was a, a re reoccurring theme in Bar Rescue is a lot of times the places were set up not for the customer's entertainment, but for the owner or the manager's pleasure. And so, but of course, they didn't rationalize it that way. They didn't realize that it was set up as a frat house for them and their friends, the party, or they didn't realize that it was set up for, so they can meet girls. Uh, but they rationalized it of, oh, this is, a, this is, I don't understand why people are not in here. It's like, well, because it's not set up for them, it's set up for you. <laughs> you know, it's funny, their ego is so great <laughs> that subliminally they assume that what they like is so wonderful that everybody else is going to like it too. <laughs> and, you know, I always say this often, guys, that, that sometimes the guy with the biggest ego has the thinnest wallet. You ever notice that? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's really a true fact. And that ego gets in the way so often. You know, we don't build businesses for ourselves, guys. We build businesses for consumers. We build businesses for them. And, and you can't build something for everybody. You got to build everything for someone. So you got to know who that customer is. And, you know, sometimes, Johnny, when I'm in that situation, I have to fight for somebody when I get to Bar Rescue. Sometimes the owner is such a jerk, I can't even fight for him. Yeah. And the staff are such jerks, I can't even fight for them. So I fight for the owner's wife, who I've never met. Or I fight for the employees. Or I fight, you know, when I did the dugout in Chicago for Smile and Ed, the owner was such a jerk that I wound up throwing the keys at him. I never even showed him the bar that I remodeled, but I had to remodel the bar because it was a block from Wrigley Field during the Chicago Cubs World Series, and everybody knew I was there. So I did the bar for the city of Chicago, not for the owner. Sometimes I do it for the employees, sometimes I do it for the owner, but within my mind, the reason why bar rescue works is because I'm fighting for something, not against something. And there's some individual or something that I'm connecting to guys that makes me want to fight for them. More often than not, it's the employees more than the owner in some cases. Uh, uh, it could be the mother, the father, the wife, the kids. But Bar Rescue is really, in my mind, all about me fighting for something, not against anything. And that's what keeps me going after 186 of them, 196 of them, forgive me. <laughs> I was going to say, well, we've seen you in a lot of those fights, certainly with the owners and the staff. And I think... The other thing that just jumps out at, at both Johnny and I is your emotional intelligence and ability to read people. And obviously working in this industry for as long as you have has to be a part of it. But is there someone that you sort of modeled or learned that from in the very beginning who really showed you how to read people and get into their core motivations? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, when, when and I attribute I, I do have this sense of reading people. I do. And, and uh, you know, I know how to push them to the limit. I know when the limit is, for example, in Jack's Firehouse, which is one of the most intense episodes I ever did, there was a moment where Jimmy was about to beat the hell out of me. And I was firing him from his own bar. A and uh, his pupils were starting to get bigger. And people, before they get violent or get to that emotion, their pupils will get bigger. That's why I get so close to their faces when I do this is I'm looking at their pupils, I'm looking at their muscles, their facial expressions. So I know when to pull back, when to go in, when to push them. I have to push them to the line or I'm not going to be successful. A lot of people are scared to push people to the line like that. I get it. My new book, which I'm working on now, is, is called The Power of Conflict. And the fact that conflict isn't bad, guys, conflict is good. I mean, I'm not talking about weapons and wars and talking about that, but guys, if we choose not to have conflict with the people around us, we throw our morals away. We throw our values away. We don't argue for the things we believe in, for the things that are important for us, all because we're scared to engage in conflict. Conflict is a wonderful thing. Conflict, from conflict comes new ideas, comes consensus. Conflict moves us forward as a society. 
So I wanted to write my new book, and it's not out for months, so I'm not plugging anything, guys. I'm just talking about it philosophically, yeah. that we as a society need to learn how to engage in conflict respectfully. I need to be able to look at you, AJ, and say, you know, I disagree with you, buddy. I still love you, <laughs> but I disagree with you completely. And I believe that I have to show my values just like you need to show yours. And society today has become so divisive that either we conflict disrespectfully, right? So AJ, I just call you a jerk. Then you're not going to listen to anything else right. that I say after that. It doesn't mean anything anymore, right? Because it became personal, not about the conflict. Or we're scared to engage. And, oh, it's so divisive. We don't want to engage in conflict today. Both of those things are killing our society. So I really think that we need to learn how to respect conflict respect the fact that conflict is good if we respect each other and the fact that we can have differing opinions and different values and different even morals at times. So, you know, I think that it's a very, very powerful thing. And Bar Rescue is what taught me that, AJ, is understanding that I can't help these people unless I engage in conflict. I can't help these people unless I get loud. I have to be forcible in the way that I go about it with them. I'm not the first person to tell them their business sucks. I'm not the first person to tell them they lost money or that it's dirty, Johnny, or any of these <laughs> kinds of things, right? So they got to hear me. <laughs> so I get louder, I get more intense, but make no mistake, guys, many of the times that you see me angry on Bar Rescue, I'm much more deliberate than I am angry. I'm creating an intensity to take advantage of the situation and change him. I haven't lost my cool, guys. You've very rarely seen me actually lose my cool. Everything I do is really very deliberate. Yeah, I've There's... certainly noticed that. And, and you never take it personally, which is, I, I think, so key about this. You understand that they're going to get personal on you because they feel cornered. And a lot of times this is the first time they've actually truly experienced conflict in that way. They have staff who cater to them. They have a few customers who put up with them. But a lot of them haven't really engaged in that way. And you always keep it respectful. And you are always in control of your own emotions in those states where the owner is typically out of control of their emotion. And what you then see is they'll come back after the emotions die and they realize I was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I wasn't actually listening to you. And I get my hug in the end, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> and that's real. And you know what's interesting about that, AJ, is when I get that hug, our microphones are on our chests under our shirts. So when we hug, you can't hear what we say to each other. It's all brr, brr, brr. So it edits out of the show. The things that they say to me in my ears in those hugs are really powerful. You know, John, you're the father I never had. I've been told a couple of different times. You know, thank you for beating me up. I deserved it. Man, you taught me so much, John. You know, I respect myself again, John. Thank you. I mean, those are the kind of things they say to me in those hugs. And it really inspires me to fight harder next time, to tell you the truth. Well, yeah. look at everything that you have, you give them. You give them their business back. You give them a sense of self-respect back because when their business dies, you take that personally and that hurts your self-esteem. You start to see yourself as dying or a loser as your business is. And to be able to correct that, give them their business back. You give them the respect for their business and themselves back. So it's a, it's a, it's a hard fought gift that, that means the world. And the lessons there are ridiculous. Uh, they're, they're, they're life changing. I, it's interesting. I would imagine the crew at this point, after having done so many of these, have know what's going to happen as, as much as you know, which is what is going to happen and how these play out. I, and I would imagine that they get ready for like, Oh, it's day three. Here we go. We know what's coming in today. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. They never quite know where I'm going to go or what I'm going to do. Cause of course it's not rehearsed. There's no script. Yeah. There's no actors. It is real. You guys know that. So, so the cameras have to anticipate, uh Oh, He's going, he's going to go nuts. He's going behind the bar. Uh-oh, he's going for so-and-so. Uh-oh. So it's a challenge for them to try to keep up with where we're going. You know, I don't wear an earwig in my ear. You know, other people in reality shows communicate with the booth or they're told, don't forget to say this, go stand here, go do this. I don't wear an earwig. In my show, at the end of a week of production, if the employees know the names of my producers, they blew it. My show is called, and this is my term, shadow producing. The producers are in the background. The cast really has no relationship. Cast, I use the word, but it's the employees. Have no relationship with the producers. They answer to me. 
you go stand over there, you walk over here, turn your body, do this, do that. The, the production crew is absent. And, and you know, that's the way I, I, I do that in bar rescue. And I'll tell you a little secret. Sometimes, you know, we have robo cameras built into the bars that we go there days ahead of time and build them in. And then we have four shoulder cameras that follow me around and follow employees around. Sometimes I'll sit with somebody like you, Johnny, and I'll say, you know, guys, shoulder cameras go away. I want to talk to him alone. So the shoulder cameras go away. It's just you and I. But there's a robo cam in the corner that's getting us. <laughs> So I will use the situation as best as I can to get in your head, you know, and try to help those people. But make no mistake, guys, when I get there, it means a lot to me. I take this responsibility really seriously. These people's lives are on the line. You know, their houses are on the line. Their yeah. cars are on yeah, the line. Certainly. They have children at home. They have wives who are counting on them. You know, I will never sell out them for TV. Never in any way possible. It always is about them. And I say it even to, to people uh, when I'm shooting Bar Rescue. I'll tell them, I don't give a damn about those cameras. They mean nothing to me. This is about us. And let's go to work. And, let's, and I really believe that. And uh, I'll tell you a little inside stuff if you want to hear it. You know, when I yeah. get to Bar Rescue, I arrive on set about a half hour or so before the cameras start to roll. I know nothing. I haven't seen any clips. I've never been in this bar before. I've never met these people before. I sit down in my makeup chair. While I'm in my makeup chair and they're doing what they do to me, one of my producers comes in and gives me the background in 60 seconds, guys. John, it, it's the story of AJ and Johnny. They've owned this bar for four years. They're in debt, $300,000. They're ready to kill each other. AJ's wife has left him. Johnny's wife is about to blah, blah, blah. That's all I get. I then get in the SUV. I do my, my recon, I see it all for the first time. I then get out of the SUV, I go into the bar, I do my recon, the recon ends. Here's what you don't know. When the recon ends, we take all the employees, we put them in white vans in the parking lot, and I go in and design the bar that night. So I have, it's, I call it a 20 minute design, guys. That's how I do it. So I get a little demographic report that I've designed that they give me at each bar. So I know the income levels. I know competitive activity. I know certain psychographic and, and socioeconomic factors of the marketplace and traffic numbers and things like that. So I look at that demographic and psychographic data. I then look at the bar. If it has height, can I embrace that? Is there a column that I can embrace? What is the concept that fits the building? How do I put it together? So I create the concept that night. We then go back. The next morning we get back to set and I have a crew that I travel with, the 57, about seven of them are in the art department. I have art tents and carpenters and everything that sets up on set with me. Day two, I sign off on every bar stool, but guys, I have to get the bar stool within 24 hours and I need 60 of them. So there's only so many bar stools I can get within 24 hours and 60 of them. Sometimes I can only get 20 of these and 40 of these. So I got to cut up the room in a way that makes sense. We pick the wallpapers, the paint colors. I redesign the back bar, the kitchen equipment. I put the recipes together, the drinks together, the logo together. Everything is done the second day because the logo needs to get to the sign maker. The orders need to get to the food suppliers. I need to get the plates, the vessels, the everything has to be ordered the second day. So while we're doing all that and I'm working with the wallpapers and I'm doing everything, guys, I, sign, I have a great team around me that bring me things, but I select and sign off on everything. At the end of the second day, we do the stress test. At the end of the stress test, we take those same employees, we get them out of there and we start remodeling that night. Say it's about 11 o'clock at night on day two. Day three, we remodel all day long because we're training them off-site at another location. That's why we go to those off-site locations because we're rebuilding at that time. The employees and owners are not allowed to come to the bar. Day four, at about three to four in the afternoon, we're finished with the remodel. I do do it in 36 hours, just like you see on television. Day four, we do the reveal. They see one, two, three, they turn around, see the bar. I go in, operate it with them for an hour or two, get my hug, leave. We go down for two days, do a loadout, load up our five big trucks, move to another location, another day of loading, and then we do it again two days later. Wow. So the entire time that we're there is four days, and I do remodel it in 36 hours, guys. And it's just like TV. Day one is day one. Day two is yeah. day two. Day three is remodel. Day four is reveal. And I, I have to say, you what know, I'm not a huge fan of reality, but that genuineness 
comes through on your show more than any other reality show that I've seen. I feel especially that you take pride in the change in each and every one of those bars that you've worked on. Is there a story that you're really just the most proud of in terms of results or the project itself? There's a few uh, that mean a lot to me because I've really changed families, you know, and changed the future. You know, Spirits on Bourbon is a huge success. They now own real estate, a bunch of bars. They have a warehouse in Baton Rouge for the mugs. They sell 18,000 of them a month. You know, Characters is a really proud one. It was a family one. But I got to tell you a great story of, of, of a bar. I, I forget the name of the bar. It was in San Diego County. It was owned by a couple from the Dominican Republic, Edith. And and uh, um, Juan P Juan Paul, uh, I'm, uh, uh, JP. So so JP was cheating on his wife. He wasn't coming home at night. So I get to the bar and they say, you know, the wife is thinking of divorcing him. He's cheating. He doesn't come home every night. He hangs out with young girls. So I said, let me do recon with the wife. And this is absolutely true, guys. So I'm in my SUV. I got my, my little monitor on the dashboard and the SUV mounted in. And the wife gets in. Her name is Edith. And I introduce myself. Hi, Edith. My name is John. She has a little gift bag with her. You know, one of those little decorative gift bags. And I said to her, oh, you have a gift bag. What's the occasion? I thought maybe it was for me. She goes, no, it's my 14th wedding anniversary. I said, oh, what's in the bag? She said, divorce papers. None of us knew it. Now the monitor turns out and I'm sitting there with Edith with her little gift bag with divorce papers and we're watching her husband and a gir young girl walks up to her husband and says, are you married? And he says, there's no ring on this finger. Well, the minute Edith sees that, she says, that's it. Well, I look at Edith, I say, well, listen to me. You've been allowing this for 14 years. JP must believe that today is different that you're not going to tolerate this anymore. And this is a new day. And Edith, I'm here. I've got your back. This is the chance for you to go do that. She gets out of the SUV, slams the door, runs into the bar, belts him in the mouth, rips his shirt open, and pours a drink in his face. At the end of that episode, four days later, and you should watch it if you can, guys, JP is hysterical crying to me, telling me that I'm the father he never had thanking me so much for straightening out his life. And she tore up the divorce papers. He put his wedding band back on. But here's the real end of the story. Three months later, I get an email from them. They're having another baby. And they're doing great. Those are the greatest stories of Bar Rescue to me where I really changed the life of somebody just because I beat the hell out of him. And nobody ever had before. And he was a tough guy. You know, had it not been for the situation and cameras and people, he probably would have beat the hell out of me for saying the things I did. But those episodes mean a lot to me. And there's a number of marriages that we've helped, families that we've helped, houses that we've helped. It means a lot to me. Two weeks ago was the VFW Hall. First one we ever done. And, and you know, their menu, peer support for these veterans is so critical with PTSD and everything. So these episodes mean a lot to me, guys. You know, it's very personal to me. I really want to come through for these people. I think AJ and I both, our first drinks were at a VFW under AJ. Yeah. <laughs> we know them well, intimately, yes. from our dads. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, they're in trouble. Their membership is down from eight million to a million and a half, and we got to get new new veterans involved in it. So it's been a cause of mine, and we did a special bar rescue. I think it'll be on Marathon this Sunday about it. But again, guys, it touches me, and it really inspires me to fight harder, maybe even scream louder the next time. But you know, I'm not focused on screaming. I'm focused on the result. I really am. Yeah, and that certainly shines through. And you I know what know... else is? I'm sorry. You know what else is interesting, AJ? I meet, get to meet other reality stars. Whenever I meet a reality star who doesn't respect his audience, I know his days are numbered. You know, and some reality stars will say, ah, oh, they don't know. They don't know. You can't, you can't, you can't. Bull. I respect my audience completely. I think if I lie about anything, you guys will know it. I have massive respect, so I won't lie. I won't deceive. I won't stage. I won't set up. I won't bring in actors. I won't bring in scripts. I won't do that because I respect the audience too much. I respect myself too much. I think it's that respect, AJ, to the audience and the process that has kept it on TV for 10 years. Because anybody who doesn't respect their audience that I know is gone in like no time. And yeah. some of them are arrogant enough to actually do that. And you leave a legacy. People can go right now to yeah. those bars you just talked about, and they could sit down and have a drink at your designed bar and see that owner that they saw on TV. Yeah. 
Isn't that cool? That's so cool. And yeah, I've been great. to a few of them. And I, I, I think that really speaks to not only your character, but also the character of the people willing to go on the show and go through that process. Yeah. Because it takes a lot of guts to admit, one, that I, there's a real problem here. And two, knowing how the show goes, they're going to get called out on their excuses and their BS. No one is going to be able to hide from that. I think the other thing that to me speaks volumes is your ability to really make calls and staff. You know, with that short of a time frame, your ability to read people and say, you know what, you no longer work here. And, and what are those signals that you see in such a short time where you just go, you know what, we just got to get this person out of here. They're not supporting the, the mission at hand. You know, I, uh, in college, my minor was cultural anthropology. And I studied the, you know, the, the science and the study of primates and social societies and, you know, primal instincts and the way we behave. You know, what we do in the second we land in a situation is primarily what we are. What we say is what we want to be. So, you know, do you land, AJ, in a place that thinks of other people first or yourself first? Not what you say, but where did you land, <laughs> right? And separating that, you know, so I look very much at people's primal. What is their core instinct? Are they there to help themselves, which I can work with, if they want to help themselves and elevate themselves in work, that works. Are they there out of a disrespectful motive? Are they there out of hate? Are they there just to be on TV? So I focus on, you know, what is everybody's true incentive? Where is their heart lie? What is their primal instinct? Is their primal instinct to be successful now? Is their primal instinct to screw people now? Is their primal instinct to get what they can out of the situation and milk it dry? So I focus on that instinct and I have the ability to read that pretty quickly in a few questions. If their instinct or their intentions are not what I need them to be, then I, I don't waste my time on them. Uh, and I don't believe that you can change people in that way. I don't believe you can create leadership. I don't believe that leadership can be created. I believe leadership is a trait that people have, not a talent that people create. And, you know, I look at people like the Pied Piper. We never hear he was a great musician, but people followed him off that cliff, didn't they? So, so you know, think of all the entrepreneurial leaders that have led thousands of people to bankruptcy, you know, whether they're solar companies or whatever the heck they are. So, so leadership is a very unique skill, and it's the ability to cause people to believe in you and what you're doing. I'm lucky. I think I have that skill. When you're a leader, either people step up to that leadership or they don't step up to that leadership. The ones that don't are gone. Yeah. And, and I have to do it quickly, AJ, obviously, because I have to get rid of them because I don't want them to stick around to the third day because then if I replace them, it's too late. I can't train the new people. So I have to make these decisions early before I get to day three training. Yeah, and it's it's so obvious how one rotten apple can spoil the whole bushel in a lot of those situations where those people are toxic and they have to leave. There's no way that business can thrive with that person in that role. Yeah, you know, I've done thousands of speeches. I give about 50, 60 speeches a year. And I always talk about the cancer in a business, AJ, and you're right. You know, there's that one employee, that cancer. You're a new waiter. You start the first day and that employee says, oh, by the, they don't check this. Don't worry about it. They don't, don't worry. You don't have to do it. So, I mean, it's this cancer that grows in the business. And every time I expose a good employee or a healthy employee to that cancer, so to speak, it's contagious. So you got to get them out or it just grows. It just perpetuates itself. It moves on. So, so I'm very aggressive. You know, I remember, uh, 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 you know, the guy who wrote, Harvey was, I forget his last name, who wrote Swim with the Sharks many years ago. Uh, Harvey always said that 95% of his problems were from people he didn't fire. <laughs> this is the nicest guy I've ever met. So, so, you know, it's true. I don't want to fire people, but those with bad intent have to go before they cross contaminate somebody else. Yeah, that's so true. We've experienced it in our 14 years in business and it's not easy. You, you want people to like you. You understand how difficult the situation may be, but you have, to, you have to get rid of it. Thank you so much for joining us, John. We really appreciate your stories, and we can't wait to come out of isolation and actually have a drink with you on Santa Monica Boulevard. Uh, I'm in, guys. You guys are terrific. This was really wonderful. I'd love to do it again sometime. And yeah, if you want, let's think about that happy hour one of these days. That'd be a lot of let's fun. Let's do it. We're yeah. going to hit up your team. We're going to put that together. And, of course... Season seven is kicking off, Bar Rescue. What are you most excited for with this upcoming season? Well, I got Marshawn Lynch coming on in a couple of weeks, which was unbelievable going into a, a 
really bad situation in Oakland, California, which is, is you guys will get a kick out. It's one of my favorite episodes ever. Wow. I don't know an episode that, that started as badly and ended as well. People that were complete enemies hated me, loved me, and I loved them in the end. It's a really powerful episode. Don't miss it. Thank you so much, John. Stay Thanks, safe. Guys. You Thank too. You. Stay safe. Thank you.